Hi friends, what's up? It's Jamie here. Welcome back to another Fango Fridays video. For today's Fango Fridays video, I'm going to finally be doing my review of Unearth, the second installment of the Pendant of Hyacinth book trilogy by Riley S. Quinn. Also, in case anyone's wondering why my hair is like this, I just got out of the shower and it's really helpful for me to put my hair when it's wet in braids so that it doesn't become like so difficult to manage like afterwards because then otherwise if I just let it like dry like naturally like it'll get all tangled and like I just it's a lot so this is <laughs> this is my solution for that this video has been a long time coming I originally got book two back in early December when it first came out but I wasn't able to start reading it until late December due to me being busy with school and then the holidays happened so it got pushed back even more but then finally in early January I was able to finally sit down and complete the entire book and so I finished it and now we're going to talk about it. This review is going to be structured very similarly to my review of the first book which will be linked down below in the description if you want to go watch that if you haven't already. Um, so basically I'm going to give you a brief recap of what happened in this book, summarize the ending, then I'm going to talk about some of the new characters, the returning characters, the main three characters, and then finally any other final thoughts I have about the book as a whole. Also, as a heads up, just as with my review of the first book, this is going to be a spoiler review. Obviously, she's a big book. I believe that this book is twice the length of the first book. So obviously, I can't feasibly cover every little detail from this book, but I will be going over um, a fair amount of like the major plot points in this review. So this is your one and only spoiler warning. If you plan on reading book two or you haven't finished it yet, click off this video now. But if you have read the book or you just don't care about spoilers, feel free to proceed. At the moment that I am filming this video, I have not yet decided whether or not this is going to end up as a two-part video, like my review of the first book. Um, but if editing Jamie pops up at any point in time in this video, you'll know why. So without further ado, let's get into the video. Okay, so where we left off at the end of The Pendant of Hyacinth book one, our Ariel, Hazel, and Talia all reunited. Ariel and Talia were fighting over whether or not to bring Hazel back to Eos. That basically carries on into this book. So they're fighting over whether or not Hazel should be allowed to go back to Eos with Talia um, in order to learn more about the pendant and to train. Eventually, Talia and Ariel come to an agreement to allow Hazel to go to Eos for two days in order to prove themselves that they are capable of assisting with the nightmare crisis and all three of them talia ariel and hazel all return to eos together all sorts of drama unfolds the longer the group is in eos hazel is learning more about hyacinth the previous owner of the pendant and how the nightmare crisis began all the while ariel and talia are fumbling over their not so subtle mutual pining for each other and in the end the trio decides to brave the subconscious forest as hazel believes that returning the pendant to the pole will allow them to resolve the nightmare crisis now obviously i just brushed over a substantial amount of plot with that recap i mean i did tell you guys that it was going to be brief however i will kind of go over some of the bigger plot points as I talk about each character. So that's what we're gonna do now. Starting with the new characters, I'm not gonna talk about every new character because we do meet a lot of new characters in this book, particularly with Talia's family. I would like to say that as a collective, I love Talia's family. I think that they are all so great. However, I'm just gonna focus specifically on the ones that made most of an impact on me. Starting with Talia's parents, Diamond and Ty, I love them. I absolutely adored them. I love their relationship with each other, their relationship with Talia, and especially their relationship with Ariel. I'm really glad that overall Talia has a really loving family because I know that I expressed some concerns in my review of book one that I was a little nervous that it felt like Talia wasn't really surrounding herself with like good people or people who had her best interests at heart, um, particularly with Harmony and Jay, but we're going to talk about them later. Um, so I'm really glad that she seems to have a really loving and supportive family and I just absolutely adore Diamond and Ty. I think they're really great parents. I also think it was really realistic to show that Diamond and Ty were struggling with you know how to handle um, the whole Talia and Jay situation because you know it's a lot easier to have input on your kids lives when they're 
when they're young um but then when they're adults it's like you want to be there for them but like and you want to like steer them away from like bad situations but they might not always want your help or like think that they need your help so it's a very like tricky you know kind of situation to navigate when you know that like your child is in a bad situation but then it's like well how do we help them because you know they're an adult and so it's a it's a very sticky kind of situation and I really enjoyed the way that it was portrayed in this book. But it's really clear where Talia gets her strength from because both of her parents are such loving and strong people. Maybe a little overprotective on Ty's end but I genuinely loved Ty's dynamic with Ariel so much. I thought it was just the <laughs> it was my favorite part I think honestly of the book. I just thought that their dynamic was both so hilarious but also really sweet because you know on the one hand like Ariel is Talia's ex so Ty definitely made sure to bust his balls a little bit which was just so fucking hilarious but like on the other hand like over time throughout the book you really saw like Ty warm up to Ariel which it was just so heartwarming to see him like take Ariel under his wing and like drag him around the house to like complete chores which is just like this is like his way of like bonding with him and I just thought that that was so cute. So yeah, Diamond and Ty all around really great characters and really great parents. Next up we have Clover. I really loved Clover. I really enjoyed his dynamic with Ariel. He's definitely a very caring and friendly guy and you can really see that through his interactions with his family, particularly with the triplets, which was so cute. But I also love how he kind of took a similar approach to Ariel as Ty did. He wasn't so like blatantly curt and like trying to bust his balls as Ty was, but he definitely kind of was like messing with Ariel a little bit in the beginning. Um, but he was also very sympathetic to Ariel at times. So it was really interesting to see like how multifaceted their dynamic was. I also really like Clover's relationship with Nanami. I just think it's so cute that they're having their little romance moment. I was like, aww, the kids, <laughs> they're so cute. Um, I also just love that he was like super oblivious to like Nanami's like feelings for him because that's so me. I was like, oh my gosh, he's just like me. <laughs> he's just like me for real. <laughs> And yeah, I don't really have much else to say about Clover because once he like kind of goes to Slope's End, he kind of misses out on a lot of the big plot points, so I don't really have much else to say about him. Um, I did enjoy though his reaction to like everything that happened, like when Hazel was like catching him up on everything that went down while he was gone, he was just like, what? <laughs> that was really funny. I really liked that moment. Next up, we have Olive. I love Olive. I think she's honestly my favorite of the Faye family that we met in this book, which is like, I'm so sad because in later parts of the book, we really, I feel like we don't get enough of her because I think she's a really great character. Um, but I feel like she kind of disappears in like the latter parts of the book. It's not that she's not physically there but she just doesn't really have much to do in the later parts of the book and I mean she does help to heal Ariel after he almost dies um but for the most part she kind of disappears plot wise which I really do think is such a shame because I loved her dynamic with Ariel the most out of anyone from Talia's family because unlike some of her other family members Olive was definitely the most sympathetic to Ariel like she was the one who was asking him questions about like like what he was thinking and feeling and she didn't just want to like make assumptions about him and I really admired her for that approach. Because even if there were points where Olive didn't really want to admit it, it really did seem like she really did care about Ariel. And I was kind of, I don't know if this is just me, so let me know down below in the comments what you thought about this, but I, what I was kind of picking up on was it kind of felt like Riley was trying to hint that Olive maybe had some romantic feelings for Ariel. I'm not exactly sure if that was the vibe like she was going for, but that that was kind of the vibes I was picking up on. I don't know, maybe I could be totally off base of that. It might just be that she that Olive was like interested in Ariel because that's her cousin's ex and she just wanted to know more about him. That could be it, but you know, either way, like I really enjoyed their dynamic overall. And again, I just think that Olive was just such a great character. I hope, I hope, I hope that she has more to do in book three because I feel like, 
like she's just she's just such a good character and I want to see her more and I want to see her do more. Next up I'm going to talk about some of the returning characters. I'm going to go pretty quickly through the first couple of characters because they were either just not in this book very much or they're just minor characters overall and I just don't have that much to talk about. First up is Anya and Sheila. They're adorable. Love them. Fortunately, I don't have much else to say about them because they're really not in this book very much, which is very tragic for me because y'all know I'm an Anya stan. She, that's my girl. I love her. <laughs> However, I do want to highlight the moment where Sheila was trying to help Anya feel less stress and less pressure about becoming the next queen of Knowledge Terrace by researching the previous queens of Knowledge Terrace to kind of provide some reassurance to be like, they could do it and, and you can do it because you're amazing, you're incredible. And I just, I love that moment. I thought that, that was so cute and wholesome and I just, oh my God, I love my girls. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about them because again, they are really, it, we get that little bit of them and then they're just not in this book <laughs> like at all. Um, but I know we're gonna see more of them in book three and I'm very excited about that. So it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> Next up, we have the Slopes and crew. Again, not much to say because they were hardly in this book. However, I will say that I'm so happy that Chai and Crimson now know like what the deal is with Hazel. They know where they are and like what they're doing and like who they're with and just what the whole situation is because them being sad and worried about Hazel made me feel sad and worried for them. Like I was just like, oh, my heart breaking for them. So I'm glad that they have that like peace of mind now <laughs> because I didn't want them to be, I didn't want them to be sad. <laughs> I really have nothing to say about Monty and Maku. They were just kind of there. Um, but I loved Nanami's relationship with Clover. It's just, it was so cute to see her fawning over him. It was, that was just really sweet to see. Next up, we have Jupiter, Indigo, and Maddox. I am so fucking happy that Jupiter got his dream. Thank God, man. Thank God. If this man didn't get his dream, I was gonna throw hands. Like, <laughs> I was gonna fight. We were gonna fight because... Oh my gosh, he's so deserved it. He's such a sweetie. I also really love his dynamic and his friendship with Hazel. I didn't realize it until they were like put together. Like they're very similar. They gave off very similar vibes. So that's, it really makes a lot of sense why they get along so well. Also, are he and Matic like, you know, like, <laughs> cause so here's the thing, right? I don't know if this was just supposed to be a throwaway line because there's a line um, when they're at Talia's house and it's the first Frost party and there's like this throwaway line about like Jupiter saying something about like, oh, we should kiss to like Maddox or like whatever. But the thing is, was that supposed to be a throwaway line? I don't know. I'm like, wait, I was that completely. I was like, wait, 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 wait. Cause like, I was like, that totally could have just been like a throwaway line. But if it's not a throwaway line, I feel like that'd be cute. <laughs> I feel like they'd be cute together. I'm just saying, again, who, who knows at this point, but honestly, I guess we'll just see in book three. Speaking of Maddox, I'm really glad we got to see more of his character in this book. I really enjoyed the way he was portrayed as like the fixer, not even just like in the literal sense of him like fixing like broken tools, but also in the way of like how he kind of like manages like his interpersonal relationships with like Harmony and Jay. I thought that it was a really clever way to show that Maddox very much has a fixer personality. Again, not just in the literal sense of him repairing broken tools, but also in the way that he interacts with other people. I just thought that that was a really cool way to do that. Also, there's not really a good way for me to segue to talking about Indigo, but Indigo, he fucking stepped up in this book and I loved every minute of it. He really said, Talia, you need help? I got you. Like, you need me? I am there. Like, here's my thing, right? Like, I feel like Indigo should honestly be one of Talia's new accompaniments. Because here's the thing, obviously I'm not really sure what's gonna happen with Harmony. I don't know if she'll ever officially like assume that role ever again, considering all that has happened. Um, but regardless, like there is still like an open slot, you know, and I just feel like Indigo has what it takes to be like 
that guy because I feel like he was that guy in this book. He's physically strong and capable. He's emotionally intelligent. He made sure to keep everything under control like while Talia was like taking her leave to deal with all the bullshit she had to deal with on the side. And you know what I just thought about? Indigo is literally like the antithesis to Jay. Indigo's motivated, he has strong leadership qualities, he cares deeply for his friends, and most importantly, he doesn't run his mouth like a fucking idiot. Anyway, I really, really like Indigo. He is definitely probably like my favorite of the male knights of the Eos, and I just, I need everything to get resolved quickly so that him and I think it's Lila? Layla? Don't know exactly how to pronounce her name, but his fiance, I want them to get married. Like, he fucking deserves it. Like, so can we please get this all over with so he can go get married? Like, obviously we still have like a whole other book to go, so it's not gonna end like immediately, and obviously I don't want it to. Um, but, you know, it's like, can, can we get the show on the road? My man needs to get married. He's trying to get married, all right? <laughs> Next up, we have Esme. I love her. I absolutely love her. She is the cutest. All of her interactions with Hazel just made me feel like I was going to explode from cuteness. Like, oh my god, they're so cute. <laughs> I also feel like Esme really comes into her own in this book. Like, she's just so much more confident and sure of herself. I really loved her character growth. And while I feel like some of Esme's character growth can be attributed to her relationship with Hazel, I also feel like she just... She just seems to take charge more in this book. Like I definitely see like a mini Talia in her. And I know that she's still young, but I feel like Esme would be a good accompaniment. Like again, I'm not sure what Harmony's deal is going to be in this next book, but if the accompaniment, like if that slot is still open, like in a couple of years, I feel like, I feel like it's Esme's. Like I just feel like, she would assume the role very well. I just see that potential in her because again, Esme demonstrates a lot of the same like good qualities that Talia has. So I really hope that we get to see Esme step into some kind of leadership role in this third book. Okay, take a deep breath y'all. It's time to talk about Jay. Just when you thought that Jay couldn't possibly be any shittier of a person, this book happened. Like, you know that line from Hamilton during the Reynolds pamphlet where it's like, you ever see somebody ruin their own life? That line perfectly summarizes, like, Jay's entire life. Because it's just like, just when you think that it's like, surely, surely it can't get any worse, it's like you, you flip the page and you're like, oh my god. <laughs> In case anyone was keeping score, between these two books, Jay emotionally abused and manipulated both Talia and Harmony proceeded to guilt trip Talia about not wanting to have sex with him and then proceeded even further to cheat on Talia with Harmony through Harmony like full on threw her onto the ground when I tell you that my jaw was on the floor when I read that scene I was like no he fucking didn't I was like, no, you did not. He literally, he fucking <laughs> threw her on the ground. I was fucking livid. Oh my God. I was just like, I, <laughs> I could not, I could not. I was like, I cannot believe that just happened. What the fuck? <laughs> he literally threw her away like it was nothing and then had the audacity to come crawling back to her. Like, hey babe, what's wrong? Why are you mad? Why are you mad? Like, oh, oh, <laughs> oh, oh. Ah! He threatened Hazel, a child, and it was not just bad enough that he was threatening a literal child. Like, this is the child that's gonna save like the whole fucking world. Like, the world saving child. Like, you couldn't have picked a worse child to threaten. Threatened Ariel multiple times and then attempted to murder him like do i need to say anything else I, did, do i really need to say anything more i think i might have said this in my book one review but i don't remember if i did so sorry if i'm repeating myself but it's just like how can someone 
make literally every wrong decision you could ever possibly make. Like at literally every turn, Jay just made the worst possible de possible decision that he could have possibly made <laughs> in that situation. And don't get me wrong, he absolutely deserved it. Like he deserved everything that was coming to him. He's a piece of shit. Like <laughs> we know this, but it's just like, oh my God, like, you can't be a bad person and stupid. Like, you need to pick a struggle, bro. <laughs> like, pick a struggle. <laughs> I just think it's almost impressive just how quickly Jay was able to fuck up his own, his own life. Like, I'm, I'm shocked. I mean, like, I'm not. But it's just like, <laughs> the downward spiral just happens so quickly. Like, his downfall, uh, immaculate but it happens so fast <laughs> anyway i'm glad jay's gone but i do have a feeling that this isn't the last we've seen of him i have this feeling that he's probably gonna come back in book three as like a mini boss i don't want to be right i do not want to see him again but i just have this feeling that like because he just like ran off so i'm like there's no way that that's like the last we're gonna see of him you know so i I'm not gonna be surprised if we see him in book three and he's just like this mini boss. <laughs> but if we do see him again in the third book, I hope that the final scene that we see of him is him either in a jail cell or in a coffin. Either one works for me personally. <laughs> oh boy, y'all. I've got some things to say about Harmony because she took us on a fucking roller coaster. At least she took me on a roller coaster <laughs> in this book. My feelings about Harmony have, like, literally roller coastered. <laughs> so from the teasers that Riley was posting on Instagram, like, leading up to book two, the ones that had Harmony in them, I thought what was happening or, like, what was going to happen was that Harmony was going to, like, purposefully drive a wedge between Ariel and Talia by like maybe not full on but like attempting to kind of like seduce slash hook up with Ariel and I was like Harmony girl no 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 I was like do not go down this road do not go down this road girl and luckily she did not go down that road thank god thank god I think maybe she I feel like she potentially considered it but she didn't actually do it which was good but just by the end of the book I felt so sad for Harmony I was like man like <laughs> I just I felt so bad for her it just makes me so sad because while Harmony is clearly somebody whose actions have caused a lot of harm she's also so like so clearly a victim that it just breaks my heart I think why some people might look at a character or a person like Harmony and be like no she couldn't she can't be a victim because she's done this this and this is because of like the whole idea of like the perfect victim myth which is just it's just that a myth it's complete horseshit there's no such thing as a perfect victim but anyway while yes harmony is has she's, she's clearly done a lot of wrong things in her life she's clearly done some bad things it doesn't mean that she deserved all the emotional and honestly again like physical abuse that she got from jay because again she she got thrown on the ground he threw her he like he chucked her like what the fuck <laughs> It doesn't mean that she shouldn't be held accountable for her actions because, you know, she had an affair with her best friend's boyfriend and she was complicit in Jay's attempted murder of Ariel. Like, those are, those are pretty serious things, you know? Those actions are not without the repercussions. But I really am glad that by the end of this book, it's kind of already being set up that Harmony's kind of being slowly integrated back into EO's post J. Like, I really hope, my biggest hope for Harmony is for her to find some kind of peace and happiness. Like, I don't know, again, if she'll ever truly be accepted back into EO's the way she once was due to everything she's done, but I hope she's able to find some semblance of a happy ending. Again, obviously, once she has, you know, properly like made amends for what she has done so I just I really do hope that there is some light at the end of the tunnel for her because again I my heart does break for her I understand that she's done a lot of really shitty things but I I don't think that she's truly a bad person she's just done some bad things